This is joint work with Johannes Boehm, who's at Science Po, and with John Morrow, who's also my co-author from earlier time. So what we're going to think about is what determines the production structure. So what we mean by production structure is what are the kinds of industries firms expand into. I'm going to be very explicit as to what we can identify and what we can't. But just to roughly give you where we're coming from, there's been a large literature with Hausman, Hidalgo, Roderick, etc., talking about that idiosyncratic production capabilities determine what kind of production structure gets adopted in the economy. And that, in turn, translates into what are the growth differences, income differences across countries. And that that has implications eventually for things like what kind of industrial policy you want to have in place to develop these different kinds of capabilities. So by idiosyncratic, what they're really thinking of is saying that, you know, just by looking at the fundamentals of the economy, like the factor endowments, you're not going to be able to predict fully what those industries are. There's some amount of sort of randomness involved there. So think of, say, Helpman Krugman type world where you don't know what precise industry, but you do know what the basic trade patterns are. So their work has really told us something about production structure to incomes. That's the channel they're thinking of. And typically, they're using cross-country income data, cross-country export data to try and identify what are the different types of industries firms, uh, countries are moving into. And somewhat that the conclusion that emerges is that poor countries tend to become rich by essentially making goods that rich countries produce. But the issue here is that we still don't know what are those capabilities which determine at the end of the day what the production structure is and therefore what these successful products are. And that's really where we're going to focus. We're going to look at idiosyncratic production capabilities and try and then give a sense of what is the production structure. Do, which production capabilities determine what kind of production structure? And specifically what we're going to find, what we're going to look for, is we're going to identify input capabilities that their firms... I'm going to keep saying firm, but really what I mean is an establishment, and I'll be clear about that in a moment. So it's saying that there are establishment-specific input capabilities, which in turn determine what kind of product mix you, go, you expand into, and that in turn is going to determine what the profitability of different firms is. So roughly our approach compared to theirs, most of this literature on production structure has really thought about things at the country level. So the idea here is there are a variety of capabilities that countries have, Products require a different variety of capabilities to make those products. And it really is sort of the interaction of these two things that eventually tells you that countries are going to move into industries. They're going to specialize in industries which they have the capability to produce. So what we're going to instead do is we're going to test that at the really micro level. What do I mean by really micro level? We're going to look at establishments. And here, very specifically, the, the definition of an establishment is that you have common inputs and that you use common resources which cannot be broken down by the plant that you're working in. So it's, sometimes this can be a bit more than a particular geographical plant and sometimes it's really just one plant because that's the only one that makes that product. And we're going to look for input specific capabilities and we're going to show that that determines specialization into the kind of industry that you're thinking of. And where this idea is really coming from, it dates back at least to Penrose with Daria and other organization people in the room, this is essentially going back to the old or organizational economics literature, saying that there's something inseparable about being a particular establishment. You can't really trade those assets away on the market, and therefore you produce those various industries within the particular establishment. So that's what we're going to use, and we're going to look for input-specific capabilities. So if I'm sounding extremely cryptic at the moment, here's roughly what we're doing. That's going to make it very clear. We're going to look for establishments, and we're going to see if originally you had a certain existing input mix, which we're going to interpret to be your capability of being able to use a particular input, then what you're going to do is you're going to try to move into industries which, in fact, use that input much more intensively. That's the idea we're going for, and that's what we're going to look for in the data. In terms of how we identify that this is really something to do with inputs, with input-specific productivity, is we're going to use a policy reform that happened, which is input-specific, and we're going to use that variation to try and identify this input mechanism. I will say at the outset, though, that this is something which is giving you a diagnostic policy tool. It's not saying that this really is the underlying reason why certain establishments move into certain industries. Inputs at the end of the, at the, end of the day are still approximate cause of what you make, they're not really necessarily the management or the deep organizational sort of investments that you might have to do to use those inputs. And finally, what we're going to 
eventually show you is that input-based specialization predicts higher profitability of the establishment. So disclaimer here does not rule out that there are other sources of complementarities, other reasons why firms might move, establishment, might, establishments might want to move into particular industries. There are things like demand complementarities at play, of course, we've all you know, heard of them, thought of them, but that's not what we're gonna be able to identify because we're using establishment level data and potentially these could be operating at the firm level, which we're not gonna be able to link up. So <clears throat> I'll skip the literature just broadly to say, yes, of course, there's a huge business literature, but usually what, it, what it's tried to do is to look at correlations and we're gonna to try to get at causality as best as we can. And this ties up with a whole bunch of different literatures, both in the multi-product firm literature where they're typically thinking of much finer products, we're gonna be thinking of industries instead. Okay, any questions? Or have I dumbed everybody into some kind of sleepy state? Okay. So I'm gonna start with uh, Imperix, uh, just broadly telling you what our approach is gonna be, then talk about the data. Then I'm gonna show you what a particular definition is that we're gonna take to the data, which is to say, what does it mean for a firm to have particular input capabilities and to be similar to a certain type of industry? So that's what we're gonna try and do. And I'll talk about the measure, why this measure is important, why this measure is sort of not important, sensible, and what the policy change was, and then I'll talk about the results. Okay. So the context we're gonna be looking at is manufacturing establishments in India. What we observe are very fine product codes for inputs and outputs of each establishment. From that, we construct an IO matrix, which is roughly 262 by 262. Just think in your mind that these are 250 industries and we're gonna be able to construct a 250 by 250 matrix IO table. And this is from all the single product establishments that we'll do that. And we're gonna relate it to the establishment's initial input mix. And then we're gonna say that this is the establishment's type, the input mix that it has originally, and that's the type of the product that we're thinking of. So that's the way we're gonna try and compress all that information about product characteristics, which IO people can, industrial organization people can do very easily because they have very detailed product characteristics. As trade people, as people who think about macroeconomics, those people don't have that kind of very detailed, fine product characteristic information. So instead, the way we're gonna sort of get a product characteristic out is through this input mix, through the input that requirements of the product, of the industry. No, we don't know ownership linkages. No. Uh, I'm going to try and do some controls for that, but we don't know ownership linkages. But I want to point out, what are we looking for? We're looking for input capabilities. We're looking for production structure, like production side input capabilities, which means we are looking at that particular unit of analysis, which is the factory where the goods are produced. That's not to say I don't think those are, are important. I mean, clearly I have a paper in it. I have a vested interest in saying demand complementarities or substitutabilities are important, but that's not what we're gonna be able to test for. And instead the policy variation is gonna show you that to the extent that those things matter in our context, we're gonna be able to pick them up within the establishment. So I'll show you the controls for that. Just so I understand this, the way you're saying it seems like uh, products have some characteristics and firms are born with some input capabilities and say, okay, so that's a product. Yeah, so some Rather than like, oh, I want to produce that thing, then I'm going to develop so this. Some firms are better at using cotton. Some firms are better at using silk. So the cotton producer, the cotton guy who can use cotton well is going to move But isn't, isn't, isn't that de defined by the, the, the initial decision of the firm about what to produce? And then I'm going to acquire these capabilities. So I'm going to say that the initial decision that you're producing, either you can interpret as purely exogenous idiosyncratic shock, which the firm is born with, or you can think about it as that starting at this particular time period, the fact that I'm doing this, I have revealed myself to be good at producing that, to be essentially being able to utilize that. And that's kind of where we're going to sort of, where we're going to start with. Establishment, uh, establishment, yeah, production so unit. That they will go back to this. Yes. You know, indeed, is it the firm or is it the plant? Is it's going to be the establishment. So in that sense, in as much as you're thinking of upstream, downstream changes happening, that's not what's going on. We're talking about purely horizontal linkages across products. That's what it's, it's about. How do I define? Sorry. 
Um, so this is really going to be about firms that are in multiple industries because we're going to use firm fixed effects. So if you were a single industry firm, typically you're going to drop out of our regressions. Um, it's going to be in this, uh, sorry, it should have said single industry. That's a, that's a typo. It should have said single industry. Um, so if you're producing in only one, three, I'm going to just come to that in the definition in a moment. So what it's going to do is it's going to say, if you're a cotton apparel producer, essentially you've revealed yourself to be somebody who's good at using cotton. You are the guy who's going to move, be more likely to move into cotton hosiery production relative to a silk hosiery, silk apparel maker. That's essentially what we're going to do. We're going to say there was some policy change that happened in cotton, which is arguably exogenous. Once that policy change happened, who was the guy who ended up benefiting more from that? It's the guy who produced cotton apparel as opposed to the guy who produced silk apparel. That's essentially what we're going to do. So, so here's, <clears throat> I'm just going to get to your question in a moment. So the data that we're using is annual survey of industries conducted by the Ministry of Statistics. Um, this is essentially the gold standard if you want developing country data. If you want developed country, of course, go to, you know, there are many other things to do. They're all formal manufacturing establishments, which are greater than 100 employees. If, uh, in terms of sort of smaller firms, that are, uh, smaller establishments that exist, that's a fifth of all manufacturing establishments are picked up every year, and then sometimes they're surveyed and sometimes they're not, because that 20% sample changes. We have consistent product classification from 2001 to 2007, so that's really where we're going to focus on, because we don't want changes happening in your industry simply because of changes in some kind of classification code. Okay, so this is getting to your question. So I'm going to call an industry a three-digit ASIC product. How does that roughly compare? That's about 262 industries that we're, that we're going to pick up in the data. In terms of what Goldberg, Kandelwal, Pauchnik, and Topalova are using with the Indian data, their data set is very different from ours because that's only publicly listed firms. That's not what we have. Then theirs is roughly about, there would have been 108 in their, industry, in their kind of classification. So in terms of what are these things that we're talking about, this is an example. And of course, textiles is an important example. So six would be the one-digit code. That's textile and textile articles. 63 is the two-digit code, which is saying everybody in cotton, cotton yarn, and cotton fabrics. And then within that <clears throat> are these different three-digit industries. That's what I'm going to call an industry. A three-digit product is defined as an industry here. Okay. So I'm going to get to now what, how we're going to define the type of the firm and the type of the product. So once again, sorry, Paula, I don't even want to stand next to you and say the word firm. Establishment and establishment production unit. And then I'm going to get to the policy chain. So essentially, the establishment's type is going to be a vector of input expenditure shares. So this is theta j. So if you're thinking of a cotton apparel producer, you know, 80% of my raw material that I buy is cotton. So this is going to be 80% for cotton, 20% buttons, and so on and so forth. In terms of the industry, we're going to construct an IO table from this sort of, from all the uh, establishments that exist in the economy that we see in the data. And what we're again going to do is we're going to look for if I focus on a particular single industry firm that is only making cotton apparel, what is the usage of that, of all those establishments in cotton uh, manufacturing? So it would be, you know, I buy 60% on average of cotton, maybe 40% of button, which could be a bit different from the individual establishment. So that's what's getting picked up here. And then finally, what we also have is what we're going to call the definition of how are these two things correlated with each other, that's what we're going to call input similarity. We're going to say that you, as a particular establishment, have more of a chance of benefiting from a particular input policy shock if you are the guy who originally was using that input much more. That's the idea here. And this is relative to everybody else who's making that particular, making in that particular industry. So this is how we're going to measure it. We're going to say establishment J is similar in input to industry K. If I take the dot product, so J, remember, is the establishment, N is a particular input. So it's theta J N is telling you how much is this particular establishment J buying as a share of its, all its inputs of input N. 
And this is for the entire industry, which is making apparel. And we're going to sum over all the inputs because we're trying to get at some kind of multidimensional correlation. We can't just pick it up through usual sort of one-dimensional measures. So that's for the industry. And finally, we're going to normalize this with the variances of these two things. The reason for doing that, I'm going to argue later, is that actually that there's been work previously which has tried to show that this reduces the bias if you change the levels of aggregation. That's kind of one good thing about it. In terms of what it also does for us, we get a measure between zero and one. And if something is zero, it's saying there's no input similarity between the establishment and the particular input uh, between the industry. So think of that as saying you're an engine maker. You have really nothing to do at all with some guy with the industry which is producing cotton. That's the idea. So very broadly speaking, this is not the level of aggregation. We're doing much finer things. What this is essentially saying is, suppose you're in the iron and steel industry. And think of that being, say, one representative firm with itself. Of course, its input similarity is one. That's what this is capturing. But if we're thinking of road surface transport, well, both use a lot of iron, a lot of steel, so pretty high input similarity. But if you're thinking instead of, say, sports and athletic equipment, almost zero input similarity. Those are the kinds of ideas we're going to try to pick up. But we're going to do it at the establishment and the industry level. In terms of how the government does it or yeah. in terms of... Sometimes it's exactly what you're doing that they use to actually define each of the 250 categories. So it is, it is using both of those things, okay. which means textiles will have cotton textiles and will have silk textiles at that broad level. And within that, it will also have different kinds of processes, could be upstream, downstream, could be inputs, things like that. So it's roughly based off of ISIC classifications, the Indian classification system. But the reason they wanted to have a separate one was because there are many products that you see Um, any, is that roughly answering your question? Okay. So here's the empirical motivation for why we're using this particular measure. So one, it's a standard measure of multidimensional correlation, which has been used extensively in the technology and patent literature. So when Jaff constructs his, if I'm a firm or a production unit, am I similar in technology to another industry or not? That's the kind of measure that he's constructing. And similarly, Bloom, John Van Rienen, and Mark Shankerman have recently used it in their paper as well, and arguing very sort of, uh, arguing a lot, saying that this was a relevant measure to use, because what it does is, if I went from, say, a three-digit aggregation to a four-digit or two-digit aggregation, the bias that you induce in measures like these, which are well normalized, is much lower than what you would get in most other measures. What is going to be really useful for us, that it's additive and policy change. And we're going to actually use that because that will give us some kind of difference in difference type uh, strategy. So this is the input similarity index that we have. In terms of what we're going to use it with is interacted with policy taken in a dot product. That's what we're going to do. So this delta TN is some kind of policy measure. When it's on, we're going to say, well, this just there's the usual plus this effect. That's what we're going to say. So it's additive, which makes life a lot easier. And then ideally, we could have run a regression saying, do you, as, a, as an establishment J, do you make an industry K? If, would you see a positive relationship here or here? That's the kind of thing we're going to do. And we're going to say, well, this is the difference that we're going to focus on because the, here the variation is exogenously induced by the policy shock. So that's roughly what we're doing. Okay. Um, okay. One final piece, which is, it's not only empirically motivated, it's also theoretically motivated. So the way to think about here is that, suppose we have a nice Cobb-Douglas production function. That's what this is capturing. The AIJs are essentially these idiosyncratic firm establishment input productivity shocks that you're born with or that you reveal yourself to be good at. So that's what this is AIJ is capturing. And it's saying if you're a Cobb-Douglas firm, this AIJ is something which is getting interacted with the Cobb Douglas weight parameter, and therefore it's specific to the product that you're making. Okay. So, given these input prices SIT, 
you can get a nice unit cost function out, which is also beautiful in Cobb Douglas. And finally, we're going to put in the third piece of information, which is saying, suppose for a moment that demand is CES and this DKT is some kind of aggregate industry-wide demand shifter. Then what you end up with is essentially, if I write down log revenues of establishment J in industry K, so this is the within firm revenue from a particular industry, you're going to pick up a whole bunch of demand and supply terms as product time shifters. You're going to pick up a whole bunch of stuff as firm industry, I should have written industry, for, as establishment industry shifters. We only just recently changed the terminology, which is why I'm kind of getting to that point. So this beta IK, remember, is the Cobb-Douglas parameter. The AIJ is the idiosyncratic input establishment productivity shifter. So this is essentially how you would write what the log revenue would look like within the firm. And if we look at the covariances between these things, under the null, that every establishment is just a collection of different industries, and though those industries don't have any kind of interrelationships with each other, we would have said that this covariance term should have been zero. This whole thing would have dropped out. Input similarity would have been zero because the idiosyncratic firm-specific input capability doesn't matter in that case. But when there are, in fact, these linkages coming through the AIJ, if these establishments are not just collection of productivity terms, if, in fact, they can use the same productivity that they have in one industry and another industry as well, then there is going to be some amount of input similarity, which turns out to be positive, and on average, that's the measure we're using. So we're using some kind of average rep uh, representation of what an input similarity, what the covariance is of log revenues within the firm would look like if you, in fact, thought of firms having some kind of input-specific productivity. In as much as those quality, you, that the, the quality uses you to be able to use those inputs better, yes, it could be quality. Um, I'm going to argue that we are going to try and, I mean, potentially it is capturing quality, and that's why I'm calling this input productivity. I'm not saying this is necessarily that you have somehow access to cheaper inputs because you have a better supply or something. It could be much more than that, and that's kind of what we're picking up. So let me get now to the part where I want to sort of the regression we want to run and the delta TN that I showed you earlier, which is the policy shock that we're going to switch on and off. So what this is doing is this is a policy which was enacted in India almost in 1955, I want to say, somewhere around the 50s, which essentially said that certain products, and there it's much a finer characterization, certain products must be reserved for production only by small-scale firms. And by small-scale firms, they're really thinking of firms that are either below 20 employees or they're below 10 employees and use power. Um, the way it's defined changes a little bit. During our time period, this is fairly consistent. It's essentially less than rupees 10 million in plant and machinery that you as an establishment have calculated at its hist historical cost. And what this is then saying is that, well, most of these plants, most of these establishments aren't going to show up in our data set at all. Because our data sets, remember, is everybody above 20 employees, pretty much. So we're not really picking up these establishments. And there have been other papers that have really carefully tried to think about whether there were cases when you saw some of these guys ma making it or not. And generally, the idea seems to be that there was very little competition in these products, primarily because there was, there was such a strong restriction on who could make it. And we're going to see, I'm going to show you a little bit of that result, too. So about 600 of these 1,000 products get de-reserved during this time period, 1997 to 2007. By this point, most of the other tariff liberalization type reforms that you're thinking of sort of are done by this point. I mean, all, not fully done, but largely over. Um, so we're going to say that this policy shock is one. If within a particular industry N, at time period T, some product was de-reserved. We're going to call that one. So this is saying any time period after the de-reservation shock, we're going to count that as one. So this is sort of picking up a long-run type effect. What we're doing here is showing that, yes, the de-reservation actually did matter. It wasn't like it was a completely trivial policy shock. So this is input expenditure of a particular establishment in Industry K when that industry became de-reserved. 
And this is with this is essentially just looking at the intensive margin of did you spend more on a particular input if that input got de-reserved? That's the question we're asking. And we see that 3% is the intensive margin change. We've also looked a little bit at the extensive margin. It's kind of harder to isolate that from other effects that might be going on. But there you do see that about 17% of the of new firms start making that product once you see the de-reservation happen. So Marty, you know also the effect on prices, on the input? So we know... We know shares. We don't... Let's have this discussion later. Mm -hmm. There's there some issues with the trying to say whether it's a price effect or a quantity effect. But what we're picking up is your expenditure. So there could be some kind of downward uh, sort of... The, the effect might be bigger than what we're picking up. That's true. So establishment J, the regression we're going to run is saying establishment J adds a three-digit industry K at time period T. So this is going to be zero or one. Did I add this particular industry or did I not? I previously didn't make it. So this would be essentially what, a, what many of the business style papers are doing, that they're looking for the correlations between these things and seeing is there even some kind of reason for looking at input similarity. We're instead going to focus on this particular coefficient because here the identification over time is going to come from the de-reservation shock. And we're saying that, well, if you were a particular establishment that initially used this input much more than some other in establishment, we should have seen a bigger effect in terms of adding products on you if our story is right. That's the kind of regression we're doing. In terms of <clears throat> what we can try to control for, so alpha JT is establishment year fixed effects. And it's going to control for things like, well, you know, some firms are just generally bigger. They just tend to add many more industries. So, of course, the marginal industry might not be the one you want to look at. So we're trying, going to try to control for those things. Alpha KT is picking up any kind of demand and supply shocks. That's really crucial in understanding what the results are saying. Because any, if, a, if an industry just got de-reserved, so suppose cotton got de-reserved, what we're picking up is not an effect which is saying that you start adding cotton. That's not what we're testing. We're instead saying, you were earlier producing cotton fabrics. Are you moving into cotton hose reproduction? Because cotton got de-reserved. That's the variation we're looking for. So are you, you're going to exclude all the de-reserved products from an industry that had de-reserved products from the, from the results? They're going to drop out. Isn't that so? No. So Am I, I, I mean, you had a ah. industry. Actually, we've done that too. The ones I'm showing you today won't have those, but we have done those as well, where you did drop industries. This is essentially saying that... Well, maybe I'm not following what you're saying correctly. Well, you're talking about it as an input, but you haven't I'm talking about it as an input. But you haven't excluded from the output side. But the KT should have picked that up, right? If it got de-reserved, all that effect is coming into the KT, not into, the, into this measure. So alpha KT would be, would include, did cotton get de-reserved and did you add cotton? Getting wiped out there. That's not what we're looking for. But maybe I should, okay. So finally, what this is also doing. No, I'm actually still confused. So you're looking at the effect of the de-reservation of your, what you were doing before, say you're saying cotton, I was a cotton producer, cotton get de-reserved and I move into so, so I see, I, I see. Let me, let me say that again, actually. That's important. You don't know. Yeah. So this would be here saying cotton fabrics. Yeah. This is saying cotton got de-reserved. Potentially here is something which says cotton fabric got de-reserved. So I'm saying don't look at that effect. Tell me instead about this. Reservation of your my initial output. Yeah. And later, if you're worried about still that maybe there's some kind of correlation there, I'm going to show you one table where even the output de-reservation stuff, we're going to vary. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I just didn't want to sort of clutter that space right now. But is that maybe answering what you're... One quick question about the policy, which I don't know much about. So it was not announced, there was no anticipation effect, there was no... I mean, so, really falling so Anne Harrison has done a lot of checks with what it was correlated with, the timing as well as the mm -hmm. policy change. Pretty much don't see any correlation with most things that we would think of. The claimed um, policy change was that we want to start de-reserving. There were two reasons. One is because it doesn't seem like it was accomplishing its original objective, which was to be encouraging certain products which they think are very labor-intensive. That's not what happened. In fact, employment didn't really rise in those areas where these industries are concentrated. 
The second reason was, um, by this point, the imported intermediates and in, uh, inputs, is the input tariffs have already been liberalized. So now what you're doing is you're essentially penalizing the domestic firms because they can't enter this industry, but you can buy it from outside at almost like zero, whatever, not zero, but small tariff duties. So that was actually the main motivation for taking it down. And from the reports that I've read, the bureaucrat who actually was instrumental in making the policy as well as de-reserving said that it was arbitrary, his decision. I mean, it's self-claimed word. So I don't know what to make of that. I mean, potentially it's still correlated, but they don't find any correlations either. Okay, and finally, what we also have in there is Alpha KK Prime T, which is saying what? Which is saying maybe there's something about technological change that's going on, which is that, you know, suddenly you, you figure out some technology that exists out there where you can use cotton much more efficiently to make cotton fabrics. So all of that stuff, at least up to a linear approximation, is getting wiped out in these um, fixed effects here. So essentially, what's remaining then is really idiosyncratic input linkages, and based on how carefully you care about sort of the identification, you can interpret this as that input similarity or this. And I'm going to go with this interpretation, saying that this is even cleaner because the shock is coming. This is saying something changed in cotton manufacturing policy, and therefore that you became more likely to use cotton. Okay. So we'll get to the results. Yeah? Import status, actually, we do. Yeah, we, we've thought about doing that several times, at least in terms of the basic stuff that we've seen. We don't see any really robust patterns there. We still need to explore more there. We, we, I'm not convinced that we have it quite nailed yet. So, but we do know who imports what from outside at the same level of detail, pretty much. But there are very few importers in the data. There are not so many, I mean, which is well known, of course. Okay. So, in terms of results, okay. I'm going to show you first the summary statistics, then I'll show you the regression and what those results are, and then we can have a conversation about whether these make sense, whether these are fully identified, what are the things we should be concerned about. So just let me say it right from the outset. There are 61 million observations in the data. It's not easy if you tell me do 10 other robustness checks. It takes weeks to do it. But mainly, why, why is the 61 million? That's important to understand. We're using an establishment for each of those 262 industries that it can potentially adopt. We're counting a zero one. Okay? So which is why the, the, the dimension just explodes because we're trying to get at firm industry. At that firm industry level, the adoption rate is really small, but don't interpret this as saying that generally there's no industry adoption happening. The usual number otherwise is about 30%. If you were to just look at firms that are in fact adopting as a percentage of all firms. Um, we're gonna look for the input similarity index, the D-reserve into, sorry. The D-reserve into input similarity, and this is the Thanks to Andy, who is in the room and who was very categorical in saying you aren't doing the, you're doing it asymmetrically, you should do a drop also. We also have the drop results now. Um, the only thing is that in dropping, there's of course a big selection problem. You can only drop a product that you, that you make already. You can't drop it otherwise. So here are the broad correlations. Looks like we might be right in some sense. Of course, no standard errors, no controls, no nothing. But broadly speaking, yes, you do tend to add positively minor, minor correlation that exists in positive and negative on the drop side. But more broadly, what I wanted to point out here was that you might think input similarity and the de-reserved input similarity would be highly correlated, that we're picking up essentially the same thing. That doesn't seem to be the case because there is a fair amount of variation going on in terms of policy timing. Okay, so here's the basic baseline regression, which is saying, did you add the industry or not? If your establishment, J, and we're looking at industry K. Did the cotton fabric establishment add cotton? So this is the positive coefficient that I want you to take away. What does it mean? It says a one standard deviation increase in this measure is essentially increasing product, mean product adoption rate of the establishment by 11% on average. Not trivial if you were to just look at the input similarity measure, not the policy into input similarity, it's gonna become an order of magnitude higher. Okay, 
Here's for Andy's sake. What about the drop result? Well, you do see a negative, but not here. So it seems like there's some amount of asymmetry going on. Don't look at me like that. There are many other results I'll show you which have still the negative and the zero maintained. It really is zero. Okay. Um, so this is essentially a robustness check. This is going to try and get at some of the issues Paula brought up, which is what about input-output linkages coming through vertical, upstream, downstream type actions? What about things like output similarity across industries? We're going to try and control for all of those things. So what is it, output similarity? It's saying, if I'm a cotton fabric maker, typically I sell that along with buttons. So I'm going to construct just like I did an input similarity measure, an output similarity measure from the I.O. tables. What is this saying? The expected upstream, this is saying, given what I see, what you make in terms of outputs, what should I predict from the national input output table, what you should be inputting into your firm? That's what the expected upstream is doing. An expected downstream is saying, I know what inputs you use, what should I predict your output to be? That's what these numbers are capturing. And what we find is consistently that, yes, the add number does seem to be positive. The drop number seems to be pretty much zero all the time, and which, again, to me is not surprising because there's just not that much sort of dropping, which tends to be, I mean, this is a hugely growing economy. I mean, there's not as much. Okay. So, finally... And they're not correlated to measure depth? How much so is add and drop correlated? Oh, how are these things correlated with each other? Sorry, I did have a table on that. Input, input similarity, output similarity, of course, we know IO tables are extremely diagonal heavy. Those are correlated. 0.3 or something is the correlation, roughly. But if you look at the D-reserved measures, then the correlation between D-reserve input similarity and D-reserve output similarity is sub-0.01. So, I mean, yes, there is otherwise a correlation, of course. And that's why we're trying to control for all of those things. Yes, this is all clustered at the firm level. Yeah. Uh, establishment level. At the J level, it's clustered. But if you have better suggestions in terms of whether we should be sort of doing more on that front, let us know. The reasoning we did that we did it that way was because the correlation you would expect theoretically would be at the establishment level. So which is why we clustered the establishment level. And finally, well, what does all of this mean for profitability? This is a question Daria asked me many months ago, so this is for your sake, which is essentially saying, if I look at profit, which I'm going to just interpret as sales minus cost, not fancy econometrics going on here in terms of what profitability is, but just basic measure of what is profits, and we take those log profits, you see that this is saying the rank or the first ranking product of the firm, of the establishment, if we do D-reserve into input similarity for that particular industry of an establishment, then this is plus, and plus here as well. This is the second most important product. And the ranking doesn't seem to change very much over time in terms of which is your most important industry, which is the second most important. So it's, there's some amount of comfort in doing this. Okay. So I'll conclude with that, which is saying... So what we tend to find is that input capabilities do determine the in industry specialization of establishments. I want to be very caref categorical in saying, yes, it's about industry specialization. It is about production units. It's not telling us something about demand-side complementarities. And a one-standard deviation increase in this, in this input similarity measure translates into, on average, about an 11% increase in the product in the industry adoption rate. In terms of what that means for profitability, it's about a one standard deviation translates into about 1% increase in log profitability. This is something we're still kind of exploring because we have sort of better data now for the profitability. And finally, what this paper tries to accomplish is to say, provide micro evidence linking these three pieces together that there are certain production capabilities which are idiosyncratic. Those translate into the production structure of the establishment. And that in turn tells you something about profitability of establishments. Okay. Very good timing. We have five minutes roughly for questions and comments. Yeah, Kalina. Can you turn on your microphone because otherwise, David Shore and Singapore cannot I'm curious about the complementarity between manufactured inputs and skill intensity or capital intensity. So I'm wondering if you have that kind of balance sheet data on firms. Can you also?
expand on this analysis by bringing in skill and capital intensity? So definitely we could do that. The reason, uh, I mean, I'm happy to hear comments on that. The reason we haven't done it till now is because somehow people are comfortable thinking of input-output matrices in terms of material inputs, but not in terms of labor and capital being thrown in there because that is going to be asymmetric. You can't produce labor, you can't produce capital. So, but to the extent that, yes, those are factors going into it, we can do it at the firm level, but we're hoping that that JT fixed effect that we're throwing in every time, if you're worried about contamination coming from labor capital, that's picking, up, picking it up there. But definitely we can do more on that front. So. So um, it seems strange not to face you as I ask my question. Um, <laughs> I just have to. The, the drops is really interesting, right? And the theory doesn't say a lot uh, for ads versus drops. In principle, I guess the theory would say we should see symmetric effects, positive coefficient on input similarity for ads, and then not necessarily, not necessarily. Zero, zero for drops. Or not necessarily, because it depends on the irreversibility, the sunk cost or the fixed of cost of... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. Clear. Yeah, sure. Um, I thought it was really interesting when you showed us in that one table, though. Uh, whoop, there we are. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. If you look at the output similarity mm -hmm. with drops, we get a negative and significant effect. And so any sort of sunk cost story, irreversibility story that would say, I should expect a zero on drop, that seems like that should also be a zero so, on output similarity. So I wanted to report to you saying you see this negative seems to confirm with confirm your theory. <laughs> I can't unfortunately quite concede that to you because we've done sort of other regressions where this number starts to become a little bit more zero. So not quite there yet, but it looks like it might be negative. I don't I don't know. It's very interesting. Yeah. All right. I was obviously thinking about vertical integration all along, but, you know, but, you know I'm, am I buying, I was, but maybe it's not, you know, like my, you're saying, okay, I'm buy, I was producing cotton, now they are de-reserving something, yeah. and I was, you know, before of the, because this policy limited, you know, they, they say the yarn producer could only be 20 employees less, I couldn't integrate it because, you know, otherwise it would be a bigger firm that, you know, it wouldn't comply with the rule. Now I can buy my supplier because now it can be bigger. So can it be, you know, you're thinking multi-product horizontal, but I kept thinking, oh, for obvious reasons, is it, am I buying an input, am I buying my supplier? Obviously, again, and I keep thinking that the decision should be at the firm level. I know your data is at the establishment level, mm -hmm. and you don't have ownership thing to do, but shouldn't be, if you had the data, the right analysis at the firm level, because after all, these are decisions no, no, actually, I'm going to disagree with that. I know Andy doesn't think so, but I, I disagree okay. with it. Yeah. If you want to look for productivity, which is input-specific, why would you look at what the other establishment is doing, which potentially you're not even correlated but with? Who makes the decision? Yeah. Who the makes deci the decision? No, no, no. And this is something which they're very careful about in the data. When they've asked for who are these decisions made internally, yes, these are establishments that are reporting. I should have got the definition, which would have convinced you. With the, the definition in terms of who is making des decisions, those are made internally. But that's not to say GE does electricity as well as motor cars and potentially there's something going on there. That's true. But let me put it another way. So one thing we can do is look for, so if we're trying to look for input-specific capabilities, we want to look at the level of the unit of analysis, which is production unit. If we instead want to think about, yes, make by decisions, and I agree those are important, then what we can do at some stage is we observe both what they buy as well as what they produce internally as well as what they sell. So we can get out from their things like carry-along trade type of issues. So those we can do and we can look at ownership from there. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. So we are in perfect timing. Thanks, Swati. So, so we can move.